let's chat about it. So, our first call asks us to union 2 and 13. So, uh, right now, we'll use the overall root to stand as the representative of each set. So, who is the representative of the set that contains 2? Two. 2, yes. 2 is its own representative. Um, a country of one, if you will. Uh, then we want to union it with 13. What is the representative of the set with 13 in it? Seven. Yes, I love it. Seven sounds good. And so in this thing, uh, or in this particular practice, I asked you specifically to decide who absorbs whom by having the larger tree or the tree with more nodes absorb the tree with the smaller set of nodes. So which set absorbs which after this first union? Yeah, seven, the seven set is gonna absorb two. So you can kind of imagine that you're just gonna take two and you're going to change its parent pointer to point to seven. And the reason that we've made this choice, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably harp on this most of today, is that by making this selection, notice that the height of the tree set in seven stayed the same. I was able to add two into seven, and that tree didn't get any taller. And hopefully at this point in the course, we all know that the shorter the tree, the faster the runtime. So we're trying to keep these trees as short as possible. Our next move, so now after that, we only have three sets left in our total disjoint set. So that two set has now been formally absorbed. Now we need to union, is that the right order? Four and 12. So who can tell me what is the representative of the set with four in it? Six, yes, exactly. We're gonna find where that four is. We're gonna go up to the total overall root which happens to be four's direct parent. And so we recognize that the set whose representative is six, that has the four in it, and I'm gonna union that with what set? Who is the representative for the set with the 12 in it? Eight, yes. Aha, so now, which set absorbs which? Mm -hmm. Six has one more node than the set with eight, so six is going to absorb the set of eight. And then if I click, aha, now we are down to only two sets. Now, obviously that did expand the height of the set with six um, in it quite a bit because eight was pretty big, but you can see in the previous version how we're doing our best to sort of shorten things up. And I'm gonna teach you another optimization later this um, lecture to show you how we can even improve upon this. So our final union now is two and eight. What is the set whose representative is two, or um, which set, what is the representative of the set that contains two? That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Seven, who is the representative of the set that contains eight? I agree. Who absorbs whom? Six takes the seven. Insert, oh man, I should really redo this because I totally could have that dad joke seven, eight, nine at some point. Like the sets are literally eating each other. Future Casey, missed opportunity. And so this is what we end up with as our sort of like final state of the disjoint set. And so at this moment in time, Remember that the point of these disjoint sets is so that we can implement Kruskal's algorithm. And in Kruskal's algorithm, we know we are done finding our MST once we've selected enough edges such that every vertex is thus connected. And so right now we have gone from like four separate sets all down to a single set. And once we hit that single set, now we know we're done. We have accomplished full connectivity, um, and so hopefully our Kruskal's algorithm will be finished running, et cetera, et cetera.
Does anybody really have any questions as to how this works? So Selene, hoping to remind you what union is. Remember that sets are truly a set. You cannot pull out one community member and move them around. They all move as a single unit. So even though we were unioning items that weren't themselves the representatives, whenever we call union, we jump into that set, we travel up to wherever the overall route is, that is the representative, and then we find the other set, travel up to its route, and then we associate. Yeah? No questions? Cool. Okay. Um, so find set is a little bit more likely to be log of n in this case. Because we're doing that like small absorbed by big, we're going to reduce those heights a little bit. But remember that that action of like go into the set and then travel up to find its representative, that is called find set. So any call to union contains within it a call to another function called find set. And this is actually one of the few times that I really get an opportunity to talk about this kind of like concealed runtime. So when I talk about the runtime of union, I must also always include the runtime of find set because that's inherently a part of the algorithm, right? So that's one thing that whenever we're talking about disjoint sets, never forget that when I ask you how efficient union is, that it contains within it a call to find set. And then, ooh, foreshadowing, maybe we like really optimize find set and these things both get better. Yeah? Okay. Our usual announcements, exercise four is due today, exercise five goes out today, P3 is due on the Wednesday of week 10, and it has an extra credit checkpoint inserted into it. That's the first time we've done it this quarter. Uh, so if you are officially passing or gaining 50% 50, 50 of the points at the 50% mark, we're going to give you the equivalent of three poll everywhere lecture at our extra credit points. This is for us. This is for you. This is really just us being like, please start early. Please. <laughs> it will be so unfun the last week of the quarter, y'all, if you have not done a lot of work on this thing. Because Dykstra's will be unfun, and if you're still working on disjoint sets in week 10, I'm going to help you. I'm going to stay late. I'm going to help you in office hours, but neither of us is going to be having a good time. All right? <laughs> help me help you. <laughs> Try and incentivize it. Does anyone have any administrative questions? Okay. Well, then the goal of today really is to finish off our conversation about this thing called disjoint sets. We've sort of been talking about the ADT, the theoretical pieces. Now, my goal of today is to make sure that you have all of the understanding of how it's actually implemented in code, because that's what I'm asking you to do for project four. So we met the disjoint set ADT, a set of sets. We talked about how there's this tree disjoint set sort of implementation. We've seen those trees. I'm going to give you another bit of foreshadowing here. This is very similar to heaps in that it's like the trees are secret. The trees are theoretical trees and that you'll find we're actually going to end up implementing this using an underlying array. Why do we learn all these tree things, Casey? Everything's an array underneath. Because the theory still matters. It does. Uh, and again, just a reminder that, gosh darn it, no matter how complicated we get with our data structures, that array is just always our favorite. Um, OK, so this is sort of where we left off. Um, remember that disjoint sets have exactly three functions that you're going to need to implement. They've got make set which makes a set of a single item. They've got find set, which looks up a set given an element and then returns back the representative. So that's the like, whoop, what's the representative for the set that contains two? Oh, it's six, that kind of thing. And then union is that take something from one set, take something from another set, mash those sets together. So I mentioned there are a couple things we can start to talk about in order to make these things a little bit smoother, a little bit faster than just relying on a bunch of tree traversals. So first of all, is we are going to add into our implementation of the disjoint set an extra field that is a map 
that maps from whatever is stored in the disjoint set to its representative ID. So you can see what we've got going on here is Eileen Santino, those two are both have a value of one and that then represents this set. So we can see those are in the same set together. You can see Joyce has a two, Sam has a two, Ken has a two, Alex has a two. That means those all four items are all together. And that uh, map could very easily be a hash map, which is our second favorite item of all time uh, because we get that constant time lookup. Then we started to do this thing with quick union, which is that idea that like, okay, we want to sort of like find the representatives, we store those representative roots. And so right now where we're at sort of runtime wise is originally if we were literally just doing this based on traversing the trees, we would probably have to like do like a, you know, one of those tree traversals that technically can run an end time because it's got to go all the way through the tree if I was trying to find stuff, right? Like if I'm trying to find if this item exists in this set, I might have to look at every single tree to figure out which item or where that looks at. But instead, uh, you know, right now we're still kind of technically stuck in that situation. Um, and I'm going to tell you how we kind of get better there. Uh, and then previously that union also would have taken end time to kind of like go through everything, traverse and change the pointers and all that sort of good stuff. But now we're at least the quick find, um, and un quick union uh, additions, we have sort of improved our runtime of the union such that if we can do this sort of like quick lookup situation here, then all I really need to do is I just sort of like quick look up, hey, like whose set is this? Hey, whose set is that? Combine those two things together. But the find is still got that linear runtime. And I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna teach you another optimization that is gonna improve upon that as well. Um, also this slide uses like the numbers, like it makes up a number to be the representative of the set in the example at our warm up, I just use the overall root. You'll find that both of those techniques are used frequently when implementing disjoint sets. Um, so, uh, quick union, why do we use both roots instead of like the individual items? Again, we are trying to mash these things together and by using the roots, uh, that will help us sort of like keep that tree nice and short, uh, instead of sort of destroying the trees. I think I showed you some examples of this last time. I'll let you read the slide. Um, okay. So let's take it back to cross goals for a second. This is our Kruskal's uh, pseudocode. And remember, we had this sort of like initialized MSTs with each vertex as a single element MST. Now that we know what a disjoint set is, what function of the uh, disjoint set are we going to call in order to accomplish this line right here? There's three options. Make set. So this line right here now what this really means is loop over every item and call make set on every item and turn each item into a little set of just by itself. That's what that line of code means now. Uh, then we do this thing where we got to sort all the um, edges so that we know how to loop over them. Then we're going to loop over every edge. And then what we're going to do is for the two vertices that connect that edge we're considering, we're going to call find set on both of them. And then if they are not already in the same set, then we're like, sweet, this is an edge I want to include. I add it to my final result. And then I call a union representing that by including this edge, now these two components are connected. Yeah? Cool. Okay. So let's think about the sort of worst case and how we can improve upon it. So um, even when we sort of use the roots and we do all these things, we could create a worst case runtime scenario of the disjoint sets. Uh, we could still kind of end up with that degenerate tree situation. So if you can imagine, if we sort of had um, this disjoint set, A, B, C, and D all separate, if we unioned A and B together, you know, maybe that looks like that where A became B's, you know, child, and then we union B and C, then we sort of like did these things and maybe we don't actually find a way to prevent that uh, degenerate tree situation. 
So even though pointing a root to the root usually helps, we can still get a tree if we put the root of the larger tree under the smaller tree. So if we were not paying attention to how big the trees were like we were in the practice problem, that's what would create the degenerate tree. Now in the practice, I just said the, the tree with the most nodes, but actually that is something called weighted quick union. It's just a little bit like more accessible if I say like the tree with the more nodes, but this is technically the term of it. It's called weighted quick union. And so the goal is to always make sure that when we are combining those two trees together, the smaller one becomes the child of the bigger one. Um, so when we were doing the practice, hopefully it was pretty, uh, pretty direct for us to look at the trees and be like, oh, well that tree that was just the value of two and that tree that was like represented by six that had all those levels and stuff, like we could sort of visually see which tree was larger than the other tree. But how do we know how big a tree is in code? So we could, you know, like build these trees and maybe we store our field, that's a size thing or something like that. But I'm gonna show you an even trickier way to do it. So yeah, that's great. Um, performance. Okay. So here we go. So let's say that we have the value of zero and we add in the value of one. We've got these two sets and we're going to union them together. So right now I'm going to make two, the child of zero. Okay. Like they were the same size, so I can't really do much about it right now. I've got two sets again, the same size. Oh, there's nothing I can really do about it. Remember that like six and eight situation we had at the beginning? Those two things were really big. And so when I was unioning to them together, I didn't really end up getting too much of a squat tree. I know that unioning based on like absorbing the smaller one to the large one is less likely to grow the height of the tree. But like we saw in the practice, when we have trees that are the same height or close to it, we could still end up with a pretty big tree. And so we consider this like the worst case tree height to be log n. It's pretty common here. And you can see then if I was going to call find set, like let's say I was going to call find set of 15. What would happen is I would jump into 15, then I have to go to up to 14 and then up to 12 and then up to eight and then finally up to zero. And that runtime is what we're going to call log n to go up from 15 to figure out who its representative is. So, there are, is another disjoint set um, optimization that's called like union by rank, for example, and it goes based on height. Um, so you might be like, well, why don't I just make sure instead of it's like the number of nodes, because we're, we're not limited to two children right, in the situation, let's just like make the taller tree absorb the smaller tree so that, you know, like those things kind of stay constant. But it is gosh darn a lot easier for us to track the number of nodes than it is the number of height or the height. Now that we've added in this optimization of that sort of like unioning the smaller tree into the larger one by how many nodes are in it, we've now reduced the runtime to log n, which is great. But like I mentioned, we're gonna add in another optimization here. So here we've got sort of like just a map of sets. That's where we started. We added in this like super nice, like quick find situation where we're like, ooh, we have a map that just sort of stores the representative that improved our runtime there. We added in the quick union, which was like, hey, make sure that you don't just like take one node out of the set and move it over, but rather like find its parent, make that the child of the other person's parent. So that improved that runtime there. And now finally, we've got this weighted sort of idea where uh, we're gonna make sure that the bigger tree absorbs the other tree and that gives us that login. This optimization is a little interesting because it's not going to help us at the moment that we call a find set. What it's going to do is it's actually going to, whenever we call a find set, as we process that work, we're going to optimize the tree as we go. And so what that means is like maybe the first time we call it, it's not going to help us out. But in later calls, the tree is going to get transformed into a more and more efficient structure. 
And so this is an optimization that is kind of interesting that it's specifically designed to improve future performance. The first call may be slow, but the later calls will be better. This is called path compression. So here is the idea. Here is that tree that we saw from before. When we did that find 15, we recognized as we were on our journey, well, hey, like if 15, if I have to go through this path from 15 to 14 to 12 to eight to find the overall representative of zero, well, now I know that 15's overall representative is zero, but I also realized along the way that 14, 12, and eight, all of their representatives are zero. Now eight, maybe I knew right away, like eight's immediately under the zero, but 12 and 14 would have had to do some amount of looping as well. And so instead of just like throwing away that information, I'm going to sort of pay attention to any nodes that I checked as I was doing that check for 15. And I'm gonna update this as well. And the way that we're gonna update this is instead of sort of letting this like long path kind of like dangle off here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move all visited nodes to now point directly to the root. Because remember, the root can have as many children as I want. So what's gonna happen is I'm just gonna keep track of who I encounter as I'm moving up my find pathway. And then once I get to the overall route, I'm gonna go back over anything I encountered and update its parent pointer to just point directly at zero. Because actually sort of like the optimal situation would be if zero is like, I don't know, Octomom or something like that and just has a bunch of children directly pointing into the overall route. That is gonna make us the shortest tree, and that means I'm gonna have the fewest iterations to loop up to find the overall root. The reason it's called path compression is because what we're doing is, as we're moving up that path, later on, we're going to compress that path and break it apart instead of one long path. I'm just gonna set everybody's overall root after I've seen them. Um, and it's just like the additional cost is insignificant. Like we already had to visit those nodes. And this actually will come up. Uh, we're going to spend a few lectures later in this quarter talking about a specific type of algorithm optimization that's based on this idea. That's like, hey, as I run any algorithm or I do any work, is there something that I can learn about my data structure that I can then store or update the data structure so that future performance is better. So every time now that we call find, and by extension, any time we call union, it means that future calls to either of those things is going to be faster. Um, okay, so uh, I haven't really talked a ton about amortized analysis. And what that really means is like, we sort of like average out the runtime over a lifetime of you working with this object. And in a lot of cases, kind of until now, the reason I didn't talk about it is because like, it requires a lot of fancy math and that sort of thing. But it really is helpful here because the runtime is going to change over the lifetime of the object, which is pretty unique. And so, um, we could get really deep into math, but what I will tell you is that ultimately the amortized analysis is that as we sort of ultimately, ah, thank you, past Casey, that's a correct sentence. Uh, as we get closer and closer, we will find that ultimately the amortized analysis kind of ends up being almost a constant time lookup. There we go. Okay. Um, Yes, uh, yes, this is all math stuff. There you go. Okay, and so here we end up with our sort of like final run times. We still can sort of hit this like 
log n as a worst case, but we know that log n is technically going to be the absolute worst case and that over the lifetime of the object that we're going to get closer and closer and closer to constant runtime. So sometimes we'll represent this as sort of like log star, sort of mention like, hey, that's a worst case, but it's going to get better. But in practice, you'll find that a lot of people consider disjoint sets then to essentially have that constant time lookup of finding the overall root. Does anyone have any questions about this optimization or how this works? Yes. Oh, great question. You can call find on anything. For example, um, like in that very first practice when we had to do union of two and two is like the only thing in there, I technically called find set on two and it was like yourself. <laughs> so find set you can call on any particular node um, and all that's really happening in find set is going from that node up to the top to find its representative. So how do we do this thing in code? Hopefully like you can kind of imagine how we would do this with trees, right? Like maybe you'd make a set of like the things we saw and we go in and we update their overall root pointers. But I promised you I was gonna tell you a way to do this with an underlying array. Okay, great. Amortized analysis, looks good. Okay, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, Oh yeah, you could watch, this is just a description of the runtime at this point for these things. I'm gonna save you from having to do this math. Okay, let's talk about using arrays for up trees. So because every node can have at most one parent, what we can do is we can then store those parents as an index in an array. So what I've done here is I somewhere have a mapping that says, whatever my value is, let's give that value an associated index in an array. So we are just going to sort of mark like, hey, Joyce, Joyce's index in the array is gonna be zero. And then I'm going to store at the element of Joyce's index, her parent. And right now, Joyce has no parent. So I'm going to set it to negative one. Negative elements then will be a distinction between that and positive elements. So a negative element will indicate to us, hey, Joyce is herself the overall root. But then if we look, we can see Ken. Ken sort of like gets to live at index six. Sam gets to live at index one. Alex gets to live at index three. And if we look at these, we can see that the element for Sam and the element for Ken are both zero. Joyce's element in the array. So the way that this essentially works then is to represent this little tree right here. We see we've got Alex and it says Alex's parent is six. So I jump over to that index of the array, which represents Ken, and we see Ken's parent is zero. So I would jump over to that index, and that's where we would get to Joyce, and then I would see, hey, there's a negative number there. That means that Joyce is the overall root. So now, instead of actually having to follow pointers and travel up through the tree, all I'm doing is jumping around to different indices in the array. Very similar to how we did the heaps, right? Like we were using those sort of equation in the heap. In this case, what we're using is we sort of like set aside this idea of, hey, whatever value Joyce is, that's always going to live at index zero. Joyce's parent is always going to be store stored at index zero. So for example, if like something happened and Joyce needed to be moved under another tree, I would come in here and I would replace that negative one with whatever the new parent is. Great question. So let's say I called find set of Alex. What I would do is I have a map and I'm gonna say, hey map, which index of the array do I need to look at to find Alex's parent? And it'll tell me, oh, you gotta look at index three. That's where we store the Alex info. And I would see that number six and I'd be like, okay, let me remember that I've seen six and maybe I'm gonna come back and compress this later. And then that means I got to jump over and I'm going to see Ken. Ooh, okay. 
I'm going to find Ken. Okay, maybe add this to the thing I'm going to remember. And then finally I get up to Joyce and I realize, oh, that's the overall route there. Now I know that I can say, hey, the overall route for Alex is Joyce. And now go back and change what's stored in these indices so that they would all just directly store zero instead. So instead of like updating their parent pointer, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to change what's stored in the element at that moment in the array to be the zero representing Joyce. And that's essentially me saying, hey, everybody just point directly to Joyce instead. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we do have to, so we do have to sort of keep track of who we're going to compress. Any other questions about how this works? Yeah. Could there be an instance where your Alex is on this tree, but then we create another thread set where the root is greater? Would that be possible? So we say it's like maybe people get. Oh, um, we, we, they all have to be unique numbers or oh, unique oh, things. Wait, right, yeah. You're right, because you're right. That would break it. <laughs> and part of the reason we have to, the unique is. is Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's walk through this with find as an example. So I, I sort of talked through this, right? But like if I call find on Alex, where our initial jump to element is still done with an extra map. So I've got a map somewhere that says, Hey, if you're trying to find Alex, go into my map, give Alex is the key and it'll spit back out the value of three. And that'll tell me where in the array to jump into. And then I will jump over to six, that's Ken. And then I will jump over to uh, zero, which is Joyce, so on and so forth. So those are the things I'm doing. That's that while loop that's happening there. So I'm just looping while what I'm currently looking at is greater than zero. Because that means that that's, you know, that's a branch node or a leaf node. This loop then will exit when I know I've hit an element that stores negative one. And then that would be the overall root. Cool. Great. Find Alex will return zero. We can still do path compression because we just set all the indices to the root index as we figure them out. Okay, let's talk about union. <laughs> so, um, okay, let's say we want to union Ken and Santino. So, uh, do I have intermediary? Yep. Um, so what I'm going to do, right, is I'm going to call find on Ken, which is here. So I'm going to jump in. I'm going to jump into six. I've used my map. I'm going to realize, hey, Ken's parent is zero. Boom, I jump over here. Joyce has a negative value stored in there. So Joyce is the parent. So the parent of Ken is zero. I'm going to jump into Santino. Whoop. Santino apparently lives at index five. It says Santino's parent is two. I'm going to whoop, jump over to two. And I see, hey, there's a negative number there. So now, boom, I am just going to change Eileen in this case to point to Joyce. And all I need to do in order to union these sets together, if you notice, all I did was update Eileen's value from negative two to zero. Now, oh, okay. Huh. Wait, where's my... Okay, there was a slide that was going to um, give you one more optimization, but apparently I don't have it clearly written out on here, so I'm going to explain why these numbers are not all negative one right now. So remember how it was like, we really got to try and figure out how to union the smaller tree into the larger tree? Well, I said if we use negative numbers at the element, a negative number is a clear distinction from the other positive numbers. Like you can't have negative indices in an array, right? So that's why I'm using negative numbers. But previously I was just using negative one, but actually I can kind of like use that element at the overall root to store more information. And what if I used that to store how many nodes are stored in that tree? 
So in this state right here, you can see that Joyce doesn't store a negative one, but rather Joyce stores a negative four, representing that Joyce's tree set here has four elements in it. Eileen stores a negative two, meaning there's two elements in there. And Paul stores a negative one, meaning there's one item in there. So when we initially call make set, what we're gonna do is like if I called like make set of Casey or something like that, I would partition off another index in this array. I would say, okay, Casey is getting added to the set. Casey's representative index is gonna be seven. And remember when you call make set, that's always gonna be like a set of just that person by themselves. So they're themselves like their overall root. And so I'm gonna initialize their value to be negative one. Negative meaning I am a parent, one meaning I am here in the set by myself. And then when I do these union moments, all I need to do is I need to sort of find until I get to the two negative numbers. I then compare the two negative numbers absolute value. So when I was unioning Santino and Ken, I realized that really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to combine the sets whose overall roots are Joyce and Eileen. And then I can see, hey, Joyce has negative four and Eileen has negative two. Four is greater than two. So that's how I know that Eileen needs to get absorbed into Joyce. And then I just need to add whatever Eileen's weight was into Joyce's weight. Because Joyce absorbed Eileen and Santino, those were the only two in that set, right? And so what I just literally did is I just sort of like math.abs uh, checked who was bigger, and then I added the two values together and then updated Joyce's value to be negative six so that she now stores her new updated weight. Yeah? Questions on that piece? Anything? So uh, we technically haven't improved the asymptotic runtime because remember the trees are still technically there. We're just representing them with an array. So as we're doing that sort of traversal through things, we still have to jump around in the array as much as we did before. However, instead of like following paths of objects and following pointers and things like that, I've now just requiring myself to jump around different indices of the array. And that is always gonna be a much faster runtime because of how your operating system optimizes your memory. And actually, our last lecture of the quarter, I'm gonna talk all about memory and those optimizations and how your cache enables things like arrays to operate so much more quickly than, say, a series of linked nodes. This is how you're gonna implement disjoint sets for P4. Make yourself a map, make that map go from the key of the item that just got added to the value being the index of the array that represents that item's parent, and then store the parent's representative index at that element's value. And then for items that are overall roots, make its overall roots store the negative value of how many nodes are stored in that tree. Any questions? Oh my gosh, y'all. I really thought that was going to take way longer, which means either I did not have the right set of no, uh, slides and this is extremely confusing for y'all, or maybe it's just a sunny Friday and we all deserve to end lecture 10 minutes early. Yeah? <laughs> All right. Have an amazing weekend. Come back on Monday. We're going to finish graphs and then we're done. <laughs>